Well, good morning. It is indeed a blessing to be a part of this spiritual family here at PSD, where we worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. If you're visiting with us, so happy to have you. I want us to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, and I know that school has started. <laughs> it's hard to time the school sermon because some of you start at different times, so I realize I think most of you have already started from the youngest grades even on up into college, so I thought that I would say something important about school, and that is that we need to be grateful for school. 1 Thessalonians 5 <clears throat> Verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. To me, one of the most <clears throat> haunting phrases in the English language is, Up and Adam, rise and shine. <laughs> and it, it's not up and then the word or the name Adam, like A D. A-M, it's, it's actually the word at, A-T, with a hyphen, and then E-M, which is short for them. Apparently in World War I, when the troops rose up out of their trenches to fight the enemy, they'd say, up and at them, boys. Well, that phrase isn't haunting because I heard it in war, <laughs> but because I heard it from my dad after I hit the snooze twice on my alarm at 5.30 in the morning before school. <laughs> to wake me up, my dad would come in in my room and he'd turn on all the lights and he would say much too excitedly and with a little too much volume, up and at him, rise and shine. And I'd reluctantly roll out of bed wondering where my dad got his energy from when apparently even the sun was still asleep. And I am ashamed to say that starting in the sixth grade, the year they removed recess. I had a terrible attitude towards school. Couldn't stand it. Wanted to be anywhere else in the world. Wanted to be anywhere else in the world. And I still got good grades because I was competitive. Wanted to make sure my friends didn't outdo me. <laughs> but just really didn't want to be there. And I'll just tell you that my grumpiness, my misery about school really just made school worse for me. It made everything harder. It made the day seem so much longer. And I really didn't make many new friends because of my negativity and because of my constant complaining. And I am ashamed to say that even after becoming a Christian in the ninth grade, my attitude towards school did not change. And I really don't think I made an impact on anyone's life in a positive way for the Lord. Yet here's what Christ says through Paul. In everything, give thanks. That means even giving thanks for school. And I'll be honest, I wish somebody would have told me reasons to be grateful for school. And instead of viewing it as a burden, to see it as a blessing instead. So I want to make sure that our students at PSD don't live their lives in misery like I did. And instead, to learn to be grateful for school, especially maybe this year under the COVID restrictions, when you don't really want to wear a mask and you don't want to do the social distancing thing, and it might be much easier and more tempting to complain. If you are like I was and feel like you have a bad attitude towards school, I want you to know gratitude for school will change your attitude for school. And when you bring a different attitude to school, it's going to make things different for you in a much better way. You're going to honor the Lord in a much better way. And I want to talk this morning about four reasons to be grateful for school so that instead of complaining about it, we can give thanks for it. But before we get into that, I need to make a disclaimer. First of all, gratitude does not mean or grateful does not mean gullible. The word gullible means you fall for anything. In fact, I remember in school when we first learned the definition of that, we'd go around to each other, to some student, and we'd say, you got a gullible on your shoe. And then when they'd go, what, where, where? And they'd look down and we'd all start laughing <laughs> because they just proved themselves to be gullible. 
The, the word the Bible uses for this is naive or simple. Proverbs 14, 15, the naive believes everything, but the sensible man considers his steps. Proverbs 22, 3, the prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. So in talking about what a blessing school is, I'm not ignoring or downplaying the spiritual dangers, especially if you're in a public school. You might have teachers even undermining your faith. If you've got a textbook that's rooted in evolutionary theory, or even in private schools and homeschool co-ops, you could have kids that claim to be religious and that maybe come from a Christian family, but they don't really love the Lord at all. And maybe they're just a bad influence on you. If if somebody says to you, hey, you know, I've got, this, I've got this hot video that my older brother showed me on my phone, the point is not to say, you know what, I'm just so grateful today, of course I'll look. <laughs> or if someone says, you know, I'm not quite ready for the test today, can I just uh, look over your shoulder? Well, we're not going to say, you know, I'm just so grateful to be in school. Sure, you can cheat off me, that's fine. No, 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Being grateful doesn't mean seeing everything about school as good and acceptable. We still need to be on the alert for how Satan might tempt us. But you know what? I believe gratitude will help us fight Satan. Because have you ever noticed it's the kids who get in the most trouble in school they're the ones that don't like school. They're the ones that are the least grateful for school. And so they cut class maybe because they say this is dumb and pointless and why should I even go to class? Or they have parties and they get drunk because they're trying to just escape from the harsh adversities and realities of school. Some maybe just get into fights on purpose because they want to be sent home. They just don't want to be there. Gratitude is not going to make us blind to evil or temptation, but it will help us resist it because we'll be thinking, I've been given a great opportunity to be in school and I'm going to make the most of it and I'm not going to throw it away by following Satan's path. But you may still be thinking, especially the students here. Okay, Brian, <laughs> why should I be grateful for school? What exactly is there to give thanks for? Number one, school gives us tools to help more people. Been way too long since I've made a Batman reference, so I'm going to do it now. One of the coolest things about Batman is his utility belt, because he always seems to have what he needs to meet the challenge of the moment. If he needs to climb a steep building, he's got the bat grapple. If he needs to take out a villain from long distance, he has the batarang. If he needs to hack into a computer, he has the cryptographic sequencer. If Batman needs to help somebody and something gets in his way, he has the solution for it in his utility belt. School, if you would, gives us a mental utility belt by giving us tools so that if there are obstacles in our way of helping people, even into adulthood, we will have the solution for it. Let's notice some educated people with me in the New Testament and how helpful they could be because of their education. Look in Acts chapter 13. That's where we were in our Bible class this morning. Let's look at Acts chapter 13, verses 6 and 7 about Sergius Paulus. Acts 13, verses 6 and 7, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. And this man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Because Sergius Paulus was an educated and intelligent man, he was elected governor of Cyprus by the Roman Senate. He was able to supervise local tax collection. He was an accountant who would have inspected the financial books of the province. He was in charge of any building projects. He was also a judge who would travel around and handle difficult court cases. He was put in a position of helping more people than the average Roman citizen because his education gave him more tools to do so. How about Saul in Acts 22, verse 3? Acts 22, verse 3, he says this about himself. I am a Jew 
born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Saul was not only educated, he will say later in his letter to the Galatians that he was in the top of his class. And because of that education, he had a huge array of tools to help reach people with the gospel. When he spoke to the Jews, he could reach into his Old Testament pouch in his utility belt and talk to them about their scriptures. He could even use the Hebrew language and speak to them and connect to them on that level. When he talked to the Greeks, he knew what their own poets wrote so that he could quote poetry from their own Greek writers back to them. He could connect to them where they were. He even knew their pagan religious beliefs. He knew what they believed about their gods so that he could make a comparison between their gods and the one true God. He could become all things to all men to help reach them with the gospel because, well, he had knowledge about all men. He understood these things. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was working through him as well. But the Holy Spirit uses Paul and his skills to accomplish these things. Look in Luke chapter 1 now with me, please. How about Luke? Luke chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4 talk about a major homework assignment. Verses 1 through 4, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke, also an educated man, so much so he knew how to do research. And he knew how to use logic to compile all this information into an orderly, detailed account. Yes, again, the Holy, he does that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is not all Luke. I get that. But God used his position as an educated man and his resources to give us both the gospel of Luke and and the book of Acts. And Colossians says that Luke was a medical doctor as well. So God could use him even on the journeys, some of the journeys with Paul and his companions to attend and help them when they faced health issues. Education gives us tools to help people in life. And I want you to understand a couple things that will help us appreciate this. I want us to reframe our thinking of what it means to have a job. So I think some people think, well, I just go to school so I can get a job so I can make money and, you know, support my family or something like that. That's kind of a shallow view of what it means to have a job. Getting a job really is about helping and serving others. Whatever career you have will be about helping people solve problems, no matter how much money you make. If you're a janitor, you are helping people solve cleanliness problems. If you are the CEO of Amazon, you are helping all the managers underneath you solve problems so that they can then turn around and solve the problems ultimately for the customers. But here's the thing. The more tools you have because of your education, the bigger, more urgent, and more complex problems we can solve for people. There's nothing wrong with janitorial work. And you can please God as a janitor. And I think it would be a huge problem if there were no janitors. But you know, the reason we pay brain surgeons more than janitors is because when things go wrong with our brains, that is a much bigger and more urgent and more complicated problem. And we need someone who has been to college for 12 years before we let them touch our brains. The more educated you are, the more tools you have in your utility belt to help people with those bigger, more urgent, more complex problems. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest complaints students have about school, and I said it a million times, when am I going to use this stuff? (laughs) And you want 
you want honesty, you probably will never have to do a quadratic equation in your life as an adult. <laughs> Maybe you will. Depends on your job. You're probably never going to have to decipher Shakespearean literature at your job. But all of that is training you and giving you the tools to solve problems so that when you get older, you can help more people solve their problems. The more problems you learn how to solve in school, the more problems you will learn to help other people solve when you grow up and become an adult and aren't in school anymore. And there's another humbling fact to think about. There are 152 million children in the world who cannot afford to go to school, who don't have any tools given to them to help people solve the bigger, more urgent, complex problems. And instead, they're, they're going to work. They're not going to school. They're going to work. And usually it's just barely to scrape by a living day to day for their families. Many of them are sucked into the child labor trade where they weave carpet or make bricks for 10 hours a day in horrid, hot working conditions, very little food provided, and that's all they ever know. So let's be grateful we can sit down in our air-conditioned classrooms with meals provided and to have tools put in our belts that will help put us in a position to help people solve big, urgent, complex problems. Gratitude for school will change your attitude for school. Secondly, school teaches us about God. Now, that may seem a little odd to say, especially if you're thinking about public school. But education, whether it is religious or secular, ultimately teaches us about God because it teaches us about God's world. Think about the contrast between Paul and Luke. Paul had a religious education. He knew the Old Testament. Of course, he learned about God with his religious education. Luke, on the other hand, wasn't educated in the Old Testament, but he was a doctor. And he would have learned about the human body. And he'd be able to marvel at the brilliance of whoever designed these bodies. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the works of his hands. Even just looking at the skies teaches the psalmist about God. Can you imagine if he actually went and studied the skies? If he actually went and studied astronomy in detail, how much more he would have learned about the glory of the Creator? Romans 1, verse 20, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. The more we learn about the world God made through science and math and literature and logic and history, the more we learn about His eternal power and His nature. In fact, this was the original principle undergirding universities. It's rooted in the concept, okay, uh, that should have been on the screen. Anyway, it's rooted in the concept that you have unity in diversity. So you have all these diverse fields of study, and yet they can all be unified as one whole, pointing to God, the one who unifies them. I'm a little nervous this next quote won't be on the screen. But as much as the universities have abandoned God now, I, wanna, I want you to know that universities were founded on this principle, that everything was unified by God. In fact, the Harvard University, when Harvard University was founded in the year 1636, rule number two in their student handbook, and again, this is from, this is from Harvard University, Please be on the screen. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Let every student. Again, this is Harvard. Did I say this was from Harvard University? Okay. I'm just making sure you know this is coming from Harvard University. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of his life and studies 
is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing that the Lord only giveth wisdom, let every one seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. Universities used to understand that it is God who gives wisdom. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That a better understanding of this world naturally leads you to a better understanding and appreciation of the one who made this world. When we learn math, we learn about unchanging formulas set in place by an unchanging God who makes unchanging promises to us. When we learn science, we learn about the beauty and complexity of nature and the vastness of the universe, and it brings us to our knees in awe of our Creator. When we learn literature, we learn to appreciate the power of language and the creative minds God has blessed us with to use language in unique and powerful ways, and it helps us appreciate God's Word to us, the language He expresses to us in His Word. When we learn about history, really what we're looking at is what happens when people either follow God or disobey God. And the more we study history, the more the message becomes clear. God knows what He's talking about, and if these people would have just done what God said, that would have never happened. Make school about God, not just grades. I know what happened there. That should be on the screen too, and it's not. I apologize. Make school about God, not just grades. Don't just memorize stuff to ace the test. Try to learn and understand why and dig in so that you can gain insight into how God designed this world. And I know that's easier said than done because sometimes... Subjects are very difficult to understand, and we're going to have some subjects that we're just better at than others, and we're going to get frustrated, and we're going to be tempted to take shortcuts. But that's why school is like a gymnasium, really, for the brain. <laughs> it stretches us. It gives our brains a, a workout. Brains are, are like a muscle, and, and as school pushes our brains to the limit to make them stronger, it increases the limits that we're able to then grasp God and understand and appreciate Him. And if we will stick with it, even when it gets difficult, here's an awesome result. Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your minds. The more we learn about God, the greater our capacity will be to love God with all of our minds. That is something to be grateful for. Gratitude for school will change your attitude for school. Thirdly, school can draw us closer to God through adversity. Paul faced tremendous adversity on his missionary journeys for the Lord. But instead of complaining and instead of uh, being miserable about it or even quitting, he said this in 2 Corinthians 12.10, Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul saw his trials and hardship as a blessing because it drew him closer to God. And I understand Paul did not write this verse about going to school. I get that. But there are some parallels between what he faced and some of these things he mentions in this verse that school will expose us to. Because school will expose our weaknesses. It'll expose things that we're not good at and things that maybe other people will look down on us for. We may endure insults from kids picking on us for what we wear or how we act. We may be distressed by hard tests or homework or relationship issues with friends or with boyfriends or girlfriends. We may be persecuted for our faith. We may have difficulties learning things or fitting in with others or making tough decisions or getting up at 5.30 in the morning or difficulties with temptations 
to sin or with hormonal changes in our bodies that cause us to break out in acne or even act in irrational ways. But ultimately, when we find ourselves in these stressful, <laughs> difficult situations in school, that's when we realize, I need the Lord to strengthen me and to help get me through these trials. And when we trust in His strength like Paul did, that's when we become truly strong. In Psalm 119, verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. A few verses later, It is good for me that I was afflicted. I am I learn your statutes. Nobody wants to endure hardship and difficulty and trials and adversity, but in a way it's good for us because it causes us to realize our need for God and his word. And when we learn to trust him, it will refine our character. It will make us more resilient. The adversity in school, it should have us praying all the time should just be praying all throughout the day whenever you get a chance in school. Praying to God for patience when we struggle to understand things. Praying to God to, to help control your anger if something is frustrating. You want to lash out at somebody for something. Praying to God uh, that He would help you control your tongue so that you, don't, so that you don't complain or maybe mouth off to your parents. Praying for forgiveness when we lust or when we cheat, or when we compromise on our morality in some way, praying for wisdom to see the clear difference between the right and the wrong path. Honestly, I think, as I think back through all the difficulties of school, maybe the World War I phrase, up and Adam" was appropriate. <laughs> because the truth is, when we go to school, we are going into a spiritual war zone, and Satan is going to try to use adversity and frustration to draw you away. From the Lord and to discourage you. And while that sounds terrible, it can actually become a blessing if we allow it to draw us closer to the Lord instead. To allow that adversity to teach us to rely on Him. Leaning on God, I'll tell you, in times of adversity is the greatest tool you can have in your utility belt. Because adversity doesn't stop when you graduate. School is not just a gym for the brain, it's a gym for our faith. It'll give our faith a daily workout too. And if we'll use the adversity to draw us closer to God, we'll come out so much stronger on the other side. We'll be ready to face the adversities of adulthood. And I'll tell you, we'll actually be able to look back at the adversity like the psalmist did in Psalm 119 and realize actually even the hard things about school are worth giving thanks for. Gratitude for school will change your attitude for school. And finally, school puts people in our lives who need Jesus. Paul's missionary journeys gave him the opportunity to meet people from all walks of life. And while many times that would have been scary and Paul was surrounded by darkness and sin, it gave him the opportunity to be a light, to bring people to Jesus. School gives us that opportunity to look with me, uh, if you will, in Philippians chapter 2, please. Philippians chapter 2. And read what Paul says there about how to not be uh, caught up in the darkness of the world, but rather to be lights. This is the verse that might be the hardest to bring with us to school. Philippians 2, verse 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. <laughs> so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among, you, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Uh, one preacher pointed out, it's kind of odd. You think that if Paul really wanted us to be lights and separate ourselves from the world, he would have mentioned the bigger stuff. Like, you know, don't go out and get drunk and don't commit sexual immorality and don't use all those cuss words and all that. He says, if you really want to be a light, if you really want to set yourself apart from the rest of the world, don't grumble or complain shows just how powerful and how serious that is. And I'll just be honest with you, one of the reasons school was hard for me and I didn't really make many friends is because I was a whiner. <laughs> I want, if, I, if I could whine about it, I'd do it. I'd find something to whine about. So much homework. I can't believe it. 
These desks, they're so hard and they're so cold. <laughs> Her tests are way too hard. And I'll be honest, I wasn't alone. It seemed like a lot of people were complaining in school. It's just kind of what we did. It was like a pastime or something. But what if you didn't? What if you just didn't? And what if every time somebody else complained or you were tempted to complain, you turned it into something to be grateful for instead? It might annoy people at first, uh, actually, uh, but eventually it will, it will help to change people's thinking. So uh, maybe somebody says, you know, these desks are cold and uncomfortable. You say something like, well, at least we're not outside in the heat sitting on tree stumps or weaving carpet for 10 hours a day while our fingers bleed. Or... Man, it's just so, how could you give so much homework? Hey, well, at least our brains will get a good workout tonight. <laughs> her tests are way too hard. Well, hey, if I pass her tests, I know I've got the material down. By your example of gratitude instead of grumbling, you can actually help others be grateful for school too. The world is already so full of negativity and darkness and complaining and misery. We don't need to join in on that. We can show them a better way. We can show them the grateful way in Christ Jesus. One more passage this morning. Let's look in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. Because we can go beyond just not complaining to be a light in the world. Jesus says this in Matthew 5. Verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Shining our lights may mean doing some things that the cool kids don't think is so cool. But we're trying to show people a different kind of cool. Like if we see someone sitting alone with no friends, we go and sit with them. We go and introduce ourselves. Or when we see a new student completely lost, just wandering the halls, we go help them find their way. If we hear someone being made fun of, we reassure them. We tell them not to listen to their critics. If we see someone hurting, we can put their arm our arm around them and listen. If we know there's a party going on, it's going to involve drinking and other kinds of things that people shouldn't be doing, we can throw a party of our own and invite kids to a much more healthy environment spiritually. School, you see, gives us an amazing opportunity to plant good seeds, godly seeds in people's hearts in their most formative years. And that's something that not only you can be grateful for, but eventually the people you're planting those seeds in their hearts, they're going to be grateful for it too someday. And I know that because I was one of those people in school that needed Jesus. That when I was at home in my neighborhood and with my friends there that weren't Christians, it was, it was all darkness and sin and, and negativity. But then when I went to school and I was around kids that were raised by Christian parents, the light was so much more evident there. And it's ironic <laughs> that as much as I didn't like school, God was able to use the kids from school <laughs> to plant the seeds of the gospel in my bitter heart that allowed me to then go on to become a Christian and a full-time preacher. See, the truth is you may not realize what your light is doing in school at the time, but school puts you in a position to change people's lives and to save people's souls. That is something to give thanks for. In everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Gratitude for school will change your attitude for school. And I just want to make one final charge to all of our students here at PSD. Up and Adam, rise and shine. Will you play your, play, put your outlines away? We're going to have an invitation now, please.
<clears throat> Ultimately, gratitude comes from being in Christ. It's in Christ Jesus. You can have that gratitude of knowing you are saved. You are in a relationship with him. You have the hope of heaven. And then you can go and shine your light. Rise up and go fight against the enemies of Satan and conquer for your Lord. You can do that if you'll be baptized this morning, believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And he is the only way to be saved. If you've done that and wandered off and you've been, it may even be that you're not in school anymore. Maybe you're an adult still now and you're still complaining and you're still grumbling. Paul says, get rid of all that. Be a light in this world of darkness. If we can help you be a light to rise and shine this morning, come forward and let us know how. Always stand and sing.